Jim Rickards, the world is ganging up against the dollar. Jim say that global dollar dominance may end sooner than most people expect. The U.S. has been highly successful at pursuing financial warfare, including sanctions. But for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. As the U.S. wields the dollar weapon more frequently, the rest of the world works harder to shun the dollar completely. I've been warning for years about efforts of nations like Russia and China to escape what they call dollar hegemony and create a new financial system that does not depend on the dollar and helps them get out from under dollar-based economic sanctions. These efforts are only increasing. In the past four months, Russia has reduced its ownership of U.S. Treasury securities by 84 percent and has acquired enough gold to surpass China on the list of major holders of gold as official reserves. Russia has almost 2,000 tons of gold, having more than tripled its gold reserves in the past 10 years. This combination of fewer treasuries and more gold puts Russia on a path to full insulation from U.S. financial sanctions. Russia can settle its balance of payments obligations with gold shipments or gold sales and avoid U.S. asset freezes by not holding assets the U.S. can reach. Of course, Russia is not the only country engaged in financial warfare with the United States. China and Iran are leading examples, but we can also add Turkey to the list after its latest currency crisis. Russia is providing these and other nations a model to achieve similar distance from U.S. efforts to use the dollar to enforce its foreign policy priorities. Take China and Iran. China is the second largest economy in the world and the fastest growing major emerging market. China has a voracious appetite for energy but has little oil of its own. Iran is a major oil producer and China is Iran's biggest customer. But oil is priced in dollars and dollars flow through the U.S. banking system. Trump's Iran sanctions make it impossible for China to pay Iran in dollars. If U.S. sanctions prohibit dollar payments for Iranian oil, then Iran and China may have no choice but to transact in yuan. See below for the implications. Meanwhile, Europe has remained a faithful partner to the U.S. and has gone along with sanctions against Iran, for example. That is, because European companies and countries that violate U.S. sanctions can be punished with denied access to U.S. dollar payment channels. But now, Europe is also showing signs it wants to escape dollar hegemony. German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas recently called for a new EU-based payment system independent of the U.S. and SWIFT Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication that would not involve dollar payments. SWIFT in the nerve center of the global financial network. All major banks transfer all major currencies using the SWIFT message system. Cutting a nation off from SWIFT is like taking away its oxygen. The U.S. had previously banned Iran from the dollar payments system, which it controls, but Iran turned to SWIFT to transfer euros and yen in order to maintain its receipt of hard currency for oil exports. In 2013, the U.S. successfully kicked Iran out of SWIFT. This was a crushing blow to Iran because it could not receive payment in hard currencies for its oil. This pushed Iran to the bargaining table, which resulted in the Iran nuclear deal with the U.S. and its allies in 2015. Now Trump has negated that U.S.-Iran deal and is putting pressure on its allies to once again refuse to do business with Iran. And Congress is again pushing to exclude Iran from SWIFT as part of a sanctions program. The difficulty this time is that our European allies are not on board and are seeking ways to keep the nuclear deal alive and work around U.S. sanctions. Europe's solution is to therefore create new non-dollar payment channels. In the short run, the U.S. is likely to enforce its sanctions rigorously. European businesses will probably go along with the U.S. because they don't want to lose business in the U.S. itself or be banned from the U.S. dollar payment system. But in the longer run, this is just one more development pushing the world at large away from dollars and toward alternatives of all kinds, including new payment systems and cryptocurrencies. It is also one more sign that dollar dominance in global finance may end sooner than most expect. We are getting dangerously close to that point right now. Craig Hemke, the trend toward de-dollarization accelerates. As the U.S. increases its use of the dollar reserve system, as a weapon in its trade wars, the rest of the world responds as the U.S. increases its use of the dollar reserve system. As a weapon in its trade wars, the rest of the world responds by accelerating its movement away from dollar hegemony. In January, 
we laid out the three key themes for gold in 2018. All of them were linked to factors affecting the US dollar. Please take a moment to review that post. As noted in that article, the three key drivers for the dollar in 2018 continue to be political risk will the Mueller investigation and slash or Democrat takeover of Congress in November lead to investigations, indictments, and even impeachment. If so, expect a complete reversal in U.S. confidence and a sharp drop in the dollar index. Geopolitical risk for now, the general geopolitical landscape has calmed. However, U.S. tensions with Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and Syria can boil back to the surface on a moment's as notice. Day dollarization risk largely due to the increased use of the dollar payment system. As a weapon, talk of day dollarization grows louder and more prevalent by the day. For this week, let us focus upon theme number three, day dollarization risk, for that s where the action is at present. Over the first eight months of the year, the Trump administration has either imposed or sought sanctions and tariffs against a seemingly wide range of countries, the most noteworthy being China, Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, and Russia. Viewed separately, it would seem that each sanction or tariff is due to a specific circumstance i.e. trade deficits with China or nuclear weapons with Iran. However, when we plot the current sanctions regime on a map, a pattern begins to emerge. Notably, the sanctioned nations are all a part of the One Belt, One Road initiative. China, in particular, has spearheaded this project, and they have also recently begun Shanghai-based trading in yuan-denominated gold and crude oil contracts, both of which potentially constitute a direct threat to current dollar-backed monetary system as well as the petrodollar recycling scheme put in place by the U.S. and Saudi Arabia in 1973. Here is a short list of relevant links, so, is the U.S. now actively using its exorbitant privilege within the dollar-based global monetary system to thwart perceived threats to its hegemony? Many mainstream articles are suddenly appearing that support this notion. In the end, what does this mean for precious metal investors? Initially, not much. It is very likely that any changes to the existing global monetary system will be gradual and not sudden. However, all investors must realize that no monetary regime continues indefinitely and the power of reserve currency status is fleeting. See below and any significant changes to the current monetary system will be wildly dollar bearish. Why? By definition, a new system would result in a decrease in dollar demand, while at the same time dollar supply continues to increase due to the soaring level of U.S. debt and deficits. The Econ 101 class you took in college taught you that increasing supply, while decreasing demand for any good leads to a lower price, and the same would be true here. As the value of the dollar declines, the dollar price of all commodities will rise, and significant price inflation will follow in the United States and elsewhere. Interest rates will rise as investors demand a higher inflation-adjusted rate of return. Higher interest rates will lead to a contracting economy. A contracting economy will lead to decreasing tax revenues. All of this will lead to even more dollar creation and quantitative easing. And, eventually, the entire debt-based system begins to careen wildly out of control. Thus, the time to accumulate physical precious metal as financial protection against this eventuality is now. Yes, we've e been preaching this sermon at TFMR since 2010, and since 2013 the dollar price of precious metal has steadily declined. But that in no way means that precious metals prices remain depressed or that the dollar-based global monetary system will continue forever. Instead, the world continues to move toward a more equitable monetary scheme, one that will invariably revert back to some sort of sound money foundation the same path that all monetary resets over the centuries have taken. By gold. By silver. Take physical delivery. And then wait for the changes that are undoubtedly coming. Weaponizing the U.S. dollar is accelerating global day dollarization. Donald Trump has in just over two years abandoned the Trans-Pacific Partnership, ditched the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, withdrawn the U.S. from the Paris Climate Agreement, and unilaterally removed American participation in the Iranian nuclear agreement known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Some of these decisions have undoubtedly received popular support from far beyond America's shores. Washington's withdrawal from the TPP was welcomed by the People's Republic of China. During the Obama presidency, Xi Jinping strongly protested the exclusion of Beijing from the TPP. 
In the case of the TTIP, European allies for the most part were strongly opposed to the treaty because European multinationals would be subjected to sanctions and fines from American authorities. The climate agreement, placing important limits on CO2 emissions as well as imposing regulations governing pollution, has been strongly resisted by U.S. energy oligarchs. The withdrawal from the Paris Accord has satisfied a substantial proportion of Trump's donors linked to the hydrocarbon industry and beyond. Finally, the abandonment of the JCPOA was praised by Riyadh and Tel Aviv, two essential partners in Trump's domestic and foreign strategies. Observing the consequences of these political choices in the months since, it is easy to see how the world has reacted in a more or less similar fashion, which has been by ignoring the United States and emphasizing cooperation amongst themselves. The TPP, with its agreements between 11 countries, has remained in place without Washington. The development of relations between ASEAN and China continues on without Washington's participation. While the TTIP has been halted, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement CETA, is in its final approval stage, an agreement between Canada and the EU that bypasses the American-inspired TTIP. The Iran deal remains in force despite Washington's cowardly withdrawal, and the five countries remaining in the Iranian nuclear agreement have every intention of respecting the JCPOA, which had been negotiated over a number of years. In addition to withdrawing from the above treaties, Washington has started a serious trade war and is imposing tariffs on allies and enemies alike. From Russia to the EU, as well as China, South Korea, Japan, and Turkey, everyone is facing the unprecedented decision to apply tariffs on trade. In Trump's mind, this is the only way to balance a trade deficit that has now reached more than $500 billion. In addition to the dismantled treaties and imposition of tariffs, Trump strongly criticized some pillars of the post-World War II liberal order, such as NATO and America's European allies themselves. The suggestion that NATO may be obsolete has shaken the European capitals to their core, even as the Russian Federation may see it as signaling the prospect of positive relations with the United States. Later it was understood that Trump's strategy was to present himself before his electors with tangible achievements, in this case a substantial increase in military spending by NATO countries in Europe. Trump wants a commitment of 2% of GDP to be spent on defense and NATO-S leaders are now agreeing on the need to invest more money. Finally, the devastating blow came with the abandonment of the Iranian nuclear agreement, creating significant tensions with European allies. Washington has decided to impose sanctions on companies that do business with Tehran from November 2018. The EU immediately passed a law to shield EU companies from American fines, but many French and German companies appear to have already abandoned their projects in Iran, fearing Washington's retribution. Trump even began directly targeting historical allies, first strongly criticizing May in the UK over the slowness of Brexit, then Erdogan's Turkey for the purchase of the S-400 system as well as the detention of an American pastor accused of having participated in the attempted coup of 2016 and giving the green light to Saudi Arabia for its commercial and political war with Qatar, a close ally of Turkey. In this uncertain and unprecedented environment, Donald Trump's best friends are Israel and Saudi Arabia, with the Italian government offering a friendly face in Europe, the only big European country not opposed to the Donald. The Italian government intends to present itself in contradistinction to France and Germany, returning to influencing the European decisions. We shall come to see how valid this political path is, especially in light of what Trump will ask Conti in exchange for political support, especially with regard to Libya and on various trade and tariff issues. Trump seems to have been outlining, over almost 24 months of his presidency, his political strategy. The neoconservatives, in the wake of 9-11, used military force in Iraq and Afghanistan, with no rival power able to stand in their way. With Obama, the strategy turned to operating under the cover of democracy and human rights, using more subtle means for bringing about regime change, such as color revolutions. It seems this general strategy continues with Trump, through the means currently available to him. U.S. military planners nowadays must contend with an effective military force that keeps throwing a spanner in their works, Moscow returning Crimea to the Russian Federation and intervening in Syria to support the legitimate government of Syria. 
Trump seems to have understood the message coming from Beijing and Moscow regarding the inviolability of their territory, their spheres of influence, and their sovereignty. For this reason, Washington's aggression seems to be focusing more on the economic arena. Trump has weaponized the dollar and is wielding it against allies and enemies alike to extract benefits for the United States. What the current administration intends to do is use the status of the dollar, already a reserve currency and the medium of exchange for such things as oil, as a weapon against adversaries and allies. And it is painful for those at the receiving end, given that the global economy revolves around Washington and the dollar. The ability to bar European companies from operating in Iran derives from the status of the petrodollar. Washington forbids foreign banks from working with Iranian banks, effectively blocking the flow of US dollars into the country. This is aside from excluding targets from the SWIFT banking network. To understand the consequences of these actions, it is important to note how presidents prior to Trump worked to advance American imperialism. As noted, following the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, several countries began to anticipate and plan against scenarios of American aggression. Alliances have been strengthened, Pakistan with China, India with Russia, Qatar with Turkey, Iran with Russia and China, Iran with Russia and Turkey, many issues are being slowly resolved, India and Pakistan, South Korea and North Korea, and many countries prefer to buy arms from Russia and China in order to keep American imperialism at bay. The methodology of color revolutions, in the light of the protection now being offered by the likes of Russia and Iran, was employed in the place of direct military intervention, as occurred in Iraq and Afghanistan, in other theaters, Libya, Ukraine, and Syria. After the wars in 2002 and 2003, in Iraq and Afghanistan, China, Russia, and Iran drew a red line regarding Washington's interventionism. The effectiveness of color revolutions was diminished when the Russians, the Chinese and Iranians started expelling the various no's funded by the likes of Soros and other globalist financiers to bring about regime change, under the cover of democracy and human rights. The outlook of Washington's political establishment is based on military hard power that is now inferior in offensive capability and the sino russo iranian one, ensuring the strategic independence of Eurasia and its partners, Turkey. India, Qatar, Pakistan, Lebanon, Syria, Libya, Egypt, the Philippines, etc. In terms of color revolutions, the artifice has now been brought to light, and countries on the receiving end of such attacks can now recognize them and quickly act to forestall them, as happened in Hong Kong in 2014. Donald Trump seems to have resorted to the only weapon left available to him, namely, the economic power of the US dollar, offering him the opportunity to shape events. It is a strategy with short-term benefits, by devastating effects for Washington, in the long run. Indeed, the only way to combat US financial dominance is to ditch the US dollar for other currencies. Washington's economic power derives from the use that the world makes of the dollar, Clearly, then, Trump's decision to use the US dollar as a weapon will cost his country dearly in the future, the dollar probably bound to lose its role as a global reserve currency. As history has shown, when a reserve currency is transferred to another currency, the empire that depended on this reserve currency status itself went into decline. This occurred with the France and Britain, and it will likely occur with the United States, if the S-400 militarily represents the middle finger to Washington, denying, as it does U.S. air dominance, day-dollarization is the obvious answer to Trump's use of the U.S. dollar as a weapon to wield against friends and enemies. This vulnerability is a wake-up call for U.S. allies who have filled their pockets and state coffers with U.S. dollars printed at zero interest rates. Just look at the situation in Turkey, with almost $100 billion in foreign debt. Ankara suffers from the excessive dollarization of its economy. It thus remains vulnerable to a US dollar attack by Trump. And without Qatar coming to the rescue with $15 billion worth of investment, the Turkish lira would have not been able to resist for much longer. The danger of an economic collapse is real, along the same lines as was experienced in Asia in the late 1990s, through devastating financial speculation attacks. In contrast, Moscow finds itself with a very low public debt and just 13 billion in dollar-denominated securities, continuing apace the day dollarization of its economy. Trump has indirectly set in motion a much-needed global rebalancing. 
Washington's downsizing into a smaller power will come about above all through a fundamental change at the global economic level. As long as Washington is free to print money, increase debt, exchange dollars for real goods, and remain credible to the rest of the world, that continues to purchase U.S. Treasuries instead of gold as a safe haven. Trump will be free to use the U.S. dollar as a baseball bat with which he can whack friends and opponents over the head. The potential use of the U.S. dollar as a baseball bat has been evident for more than a decade for Russians, Chinese, and Iranians. For this reason, they have been exchanging their dollars for other currencies for years. The United States, as a declining empire, is lashing out, employing every weapon available to try and arrest its diminishing status as the world's sole superpower. Now it is the turn of America's allies to relinquish the dollar, coming to understand that real sovereignty is ensured through economic sovereignty.